Okay. So welcome everybody. Uh, thank you very much for joining, uh, for taking time out of your busy lives. Um, I know this is tough times and um, you, a lot of you are on this call because you're struggling. So I really hope that we can help some of you today, give you things to think about, um, give you information. Um, the slide pack will be made available at the end. So don't be off put by the amount of words that are on there. I did put, I have put quite a lot of information in here because when you have the slide pack, I want you to be able to go through and actually still understand and remember what, what I was talking about. Um, there is a little bit of numbers in here, but also don't be put off by that. I'm not going to go through the numbers too much now. They're in there so that when you are at home looking at the slide deck on your own, trying to do some of these things, you can look at it in more detail. Um, also, don't be put off by accounting and finance. Most of the stuff that you need to do now and that you should be doing now and that you can do to help yourself, a lot of it is fairly simple and fairly logical. Um, I find that some people just panic when they haven't got financial records at this time, but there are lots that you can do to help yourself. And there's a lot of people out there, not just us, there's a lot of people out there who can help you and want to help you. So you are hopefully all in good hands. Um, okay, first of all, have my contact details here. Yeah. If anyone wishes to speak to me or email me after this, um, please feel free to. Any questions you feel don't get answered within the session, I'll definitely get back to you. Um, the presentation is aimed at micro and small businesses. Um, there's a lot of people wanting to know what is government offering? What can you get right now? This is changing every day. The government are coming out with more things every day and refining other things. So as well as giving you what the current measures are, I've also put some links in the presentation so that you can keep going back to the links and updating yourself on any advancements which, which might take place. Tomorrow, a lot of the things that this presentation have they might have changed. So it is important that you keep up to date with the, the current uh, offerings of the government and everybody else. Um, okay, again, I think everyone's muted their mics. If anyone's just joined and they haven't, please mute. Um, hopefully my dogs won't be too disruptive. They have been locked in a room right now, so hopefully they'll be okay there for a bit. Okay, let's crack on. So firstly, Quickly, what we're going to run through, I'm going to go through with you the CICDD programs that they're offering, relief programs, uh, and then talk you through the financial analysis of what um, you might have to do or what people can help you to do in order to get these loans and the grants that are being offered to you. I'm going to go through with you some simple cash flow forecasting tips, so don't be scared of the word. Um, you can keep it simple, but I encourage all of you to do some cash flow forecasting for your businesses. It will help, I promise you. Okay, we're then going to go through some accounting and operational kind of efficiencies, efficiencies and tips and things that you should be thinking about, as well as the breathe and the weather, the storm slides are, are about taking this time. There's, apart from panic, which you shouldn't be doing, there's really good stuff that you should be doing in this time to prepare you for the new normal, which is going to come out of this. Um, there's also then the last couple of sections are very practical and I hope very helpful information for you on employee leave, severance, pay. Um, a lot of you unfortunately might be in a situation where you're thinking about severance and you need to know and keep informed on what your duties are with that. And then I've got a list of the current Cayman Islands government assistance that they're offering. Um, the Legislative Assembly met last night, so I've updated the slides for some of the things that were passed yesterday, which is good. And then at the end, I have a list of useful websites and contacts for you. Um, I can't deal with everything now, but there's a list of people to contact for your specific needs. There's a lot of help being offered for free. If you don't ask, you don't get. So reach out to anybody that you know who can help you um, and Cayman will get through this together. All right, starting off. 
So the Cayman Islands Centre of Business Development, CICBD, they are offering there's four assistance programs that they're currently offering. Um, most of you probably would have heard this before, but I am going to run through this again for those of you who aren't aware. Um, this is the government's initial response to help businesses. Um, I think that it's really good. It's really going to help some of, some of you out there, um, but it is just the initial response. It's not the only response. So this isn't their response and then they're abandoning you. This is just the first stage. Okay, so the four assistance programs. First one is a low interest loan program. This loan is available to just companies that are 100% Caymanian owned. That's really important. And this isn't because the government's trying to exclude other businesses. It's because it's being initiated with the um, Cayman Islands Development Bank. That's who the loan's going through. And in the law, the Cayman Islands Development Bank can only give loans to companies if they're 100% Caymanian owned. And that's the reason for this. They're not trying to be excluded of the 60-40 shares or other shares. Um, they just can only do it to 100% Caymanian businesses. The loans are up to $50,000 CI dollars for small businesses and $20,000 for micro businesses. I have the definition of small and micro in these slides later on. They do require security. So 20% security is required in order to get this loan. Uh, the usual securities um, do go like your house, maybe boats if your company has big machinery, uh, but also other assets, the, the Cayman Islands De Cent uh, Development Bank are available to assess on a case-by-case -case basis your individual requirements and what you have to offer. Um, so if you're 100% Caymanian owned and you're affected by this, apply. There's no harm in applying. Um, there are other options as well if you don't end up getting this, but this is such a great resource, um, really worth applying for. Another stipulation, in order to qualify for the loan, companies do need to be at least 12 months old to apply. So if you have a brand new company, unfortunately, you're not eligible for this. And once you've submitted all of the correct application documents, the CICBD, you don't put your applications in direct to the central bank, it goes through the CICBD, they're going to help you with all of this. Once the right documents are submitted to them, they estimate they're trying to do the turnaround about four weeks until you would get a loan if you're approved. Okay, the next program is called the Technical Assistance Program. If you do get the loan that we've just talked about, you will be required to take part in the technical assistance program. And this is designed to help you with the financial requirements that you're gonna to need to get and service the loan. It's gonna be carried out by various qualified professionals working through the CICBD. They're gonna be called your technical assistants. You'll be allocated somebody. And you are not going to have to pay these technical assistants for advice. They're all professionals in the community, um, like Berman Fisher, for example, and lots of other companies out there also taking part in this. Um, you get 20 hours per year for your business. Um, your person helping you may give you more, um, but they're going to help you put together what you need to get the loan through and also help you look at your business, help you look at efficiencies that you can make, help with operational efficiencies. They're really gonna try and help you to come through this and actually better company instead of just giving you a loan and letting you get on with it. So it is a requirement for you to take part in the interest technical assistance program if you are gonna get a loan. The third option as well is a micro and small business grant. This, is, this grant is to help you with your working capital only. So it's 1,000 CI per month for three months, so a total of 3,000 CI. It will not be paid to you directly, it will be paid to your vendors. And so it's to help with working capital, it's $3,000 in total. So this is not, if your company is gonna to struggle to survive for months. This isn't gonna save your company, but it's a really good measure to help you with your cash flow in the short term. 
Um, the business does not have to be 100% Caymanian owned to apply for this. Um, and the definitions of a micro business is if you have four or less employees, not including the owner, and you have less than 250K revenue in a year. Revenue is the same thing as sales. It's what your, com your customers are paying you. So the money that you're bringing in, less than 250,000 a year. To be classed as a small business, you need to have 12 or less employees, not including the owner, and less than $750,000 in revenue per year. Once you do put the application documents into the CICBD again, they're gonna take your application documents. Once you've given them all the correct documents, they hope that it will take two weeks to process. I'm sure as all of you can understand, uh, the CICBD are inundated with emails right now. Uh, there's a lot of people applying for these things, so do give them time to respond to you, um, but all the process of these things does go through the CICBD. The fourth option as well is training. There's gonna be various business topics to help you. Your technical assistant might suggest various topics for you that might be helpful, and also the CICBD may require you to go on and learn about specific topics depending on what your technical assistant and them have seen when they look at your business. Um, quickly, note that you can apply for both the loan and the grant. So if you think you qualify for both, you can apply for both, no problem, and you may get both. So don't, it's not a picking either or either at this stage. Okay. For the financial requirement side of getting the loan and the grant, I imagine this might be making a lot of you a little bit nervous, especially if you don't have any sort of financial records at the moment. If that's the case, you're not alone. In fact, I think a lot of people are in the same situation as you, and the CICBD are putting in a lot of great measures to help you, so don't panic. Firstly, what they do require, if you want to apply for the grant, they're going to require 12 months of bookkeeping records. This doesn't mean accounts. Um, it just means they want evidence of business transactions. So if you have receipts in a box, you have your business bank statements, all of that is evidence of business transactions taking place. And it also doesn't have to be 12 consecutive months if, you, if that's not possible to get. The requirements to qualify for the loan are a bit more stringent. You want two years financial statements. Again, these don't have to be audited. And the reason why we have the technical assistance program is that you will be able to use your technical assistant to help you get the financial data that you are required to, to give to the CICBD. Um, so there is help out there for you. And the, through the CICBD, they will allocate you a technical assistant. They will tell you what information they need and your technical assistant will help you pull it together. In the meantime though, I don't suggest that you ignore your, fi your finances until the requirements come through. There are some simple things you can do to help yourself, help your business going forward and to help you prepare for when the CICBD asks you for your financial information. And when you're given your technical assistance, there is stuff you can have ready waiting for them that's gonna really help them. So I'm gonna go through that now. Firstly, gather all the receipts you have available. If you're the type of people who have boxes and boxes of receipts that you've kept for the last few years, that this is actually a great time when that's gonna be useful. Sort through those receipts, make it easy so that anyone who's going to be looking at these is going to really know, be able to um, be able to look through them for you. Uh, secondly, if you don't have receipts, don't worry. A good idea is for vendors who are uh, the big vendors who you know have good financial records, they will have statements for you. So. Uh, go to those vendors and ask them for, it's called an activity report for the last two years, and they'll be able to give you a statement of everything, every invoice that you've received from them, every bill that you've got, and every payment you've made to them for the last two years. And that is a really good support for the CICBD to show that you are a business, 
you are making payments as a business in the community. Thirdly, this is where a lot of you, <laughs> I think I'm gonna lose a lot of you, but hold on. Um, it's more complicated than it sounds. If you have simple Excel skills, you can do this quite easily and it's really, really gonna help. If you download the last two years of your bank statements and your credit card statements into Excel and perform some very basic financial analysis on this. Um, I do have a list here of what to do, but I'm gonna actually explain with an example in the next slide. I think it's gonna make it easier and if you're not sure what I'm talking about or you don't think you can do this, this is what your technical assistant is here to help you with. So don't panic. Okay, next slide. Here we go. We have the first three columns are a downloaded example from a bank statement. Obviously this is fictitious, I've made this up. But when you, you all know whether you download a, a bank statement in Excel or CSV, usually you see CSV, that's what you need to click on, but when it downloads, it, it's the same thing as Microsoft Excel. You have the dates on the left-hand side, the amount that's come in or out, and then you have the bank description. Those are all given to you on your bank statements. What I want you to do is the fourth column, which is basically listing what these transactions were for, Keep it simple. You're supposed to be listing them so that your technical assistant can then use this information to prepare financial statements for you. So if we quickly just go through, this won't take long. The first one, check deposit, money coming in. This is because you've sold something to someone and they've given you a check. This is gonna be revenue. Online transfer, client number one's transferred you money online. Same thing, that is revenue, it's someone giving you your sold goods or services to them and they're paying you. Fourth one down, we've got John Doe electrical repairs. This is you getting electrical repairs done, that's repairs and maintenance. So I won't go down the full list, but this is here for when you get the, if you can just mute, uh, mute your mics, if you can, that'd be great. Just got a bit of interference there. Uh, if you look at this slide when you get it after the, after the chat and it will help you. If you do download your bank statements, if you sort all your two years by bank description, you'll find that all of your bank services charges together, so you can put those to bank charges, for example, all together. Your maintenance fees, which is also bank charges, will all be together. All your money coming in with check deposit descriptions will all be together. That will make your coding of the accounts of where you want it to go to very very simple if this has confused anybody don't worry um, you can reach out to us afterwards we can help you your technical assistant the CICBD allocates you can also help you um, so but this is an example of what you should be doing if you can if you do not have financial records before if you have financial records they're absolutely perfect but I, uh, I think a lot of people out there might not have anything. Okay, you can, this information that you've downloaded and you've, an, you've now analyzed, it's important to actually use that to help your business as well. So you're not just doing this for the CICBD, for the loan requirements and the grant requirements, you're actually doing this because it can help you. So once you've done this, or if, if you decide not to do the Excel download, you can still do all of these from your knowledge of the business. So it's important to analyze your financial situation and there are some simple ways to do that. It doesn't have to be complicated. I think the first thing to remember, which you should have all heard this phrase, cash is king. <clears throat> what that means is the cash that you have in your bank account now is yours to spend how you choose. Once you pay this money out, it's gone, you cannot get it back. So you really need to think about the future, the next few months, and what expenses you're going to incur and decide how you're going to spend the money that you do have. Um, don't just react to people who are asking you for money that you owe them. Don't just react and pay them, you really have to plan. Secondly, cut back on all non-essential spending. I imagine most of you have done that already. Uh, go through your account, if you have accounts,
go through them on a line by line basis, trying to figure out are things necessary or not? Are you actually being charged for the right thing? A prime example of this is phones. When you get your phone bills, often companies, they don't, you don't look at your phone bill. If you do, are you using the things that you're being charged for? Do you need as much bandwidth as you're, as you're getting? Are they charging you for a mobile phone that you used to have years ago and they're still charging you a set fee? This is the time to go through all of this stuff. I know it's boring administration, but every penny counts. And if you can cut off something that's $50 a month, adding up over time, that's going to that's gonna add up. Okay, thirdly, go through your credit card statements. There are always amounts that get small amounts that get charged to your credit card every month. If you don't need them, cancel it. I think often a lot of us just, it's, it's so much hassle to cancel them. We might let them keep rolling. This is the time to get that sort of stuff done. Cancel anything that you don't need. Also, reach out to your current service providers. Everybody is going through this. Everybody is suffering somewhat, but people are very cognizant that some are suffering more than others so reach out to your service providers if you have good relationships with them and you have loyalty and if they are in a position to help you they may choose to do so if you don't ask for a discount you won't get it so ask the worst they can do is say no if you do owe them currently instead of a discount they may just let you defer your payments further down the line. Um, so definitely ask. Um, they can say no, but if you don't ask, they're not going to come and volunteer it for you. Chasing accounts receivables. So if you have a lot of people there that do owe you money, now's the time to be cognizant that everybody's struggling, but you do have to protect your business. You know your situation. If you need that money and you need it to survive, chase for that payment. Um, people will respond to those who are chasing them hardest. If you want to be paid, you need to chase people up. You need to be sending them their statements. You need to be resending them their invoices that you do owe them. Um, and gradually, as people can, they will pay you. And then a suggestion. To have a, if you do have accounts, create a separate line item for any expenses incurred during, due to COVID-19, uh, such as you might have to have bought more cleaning supplies. Um, there's a lot of different expenses, maybe severance pay that you've had to incur that you wouldn't normally. There's a chance, I don't know, there's just a chance that there might be some sort of relief coming down the line for any extra expenses you've incurred. Now, the government has not said this. This is not anything official. This is just coming from me. It's a possibility. And if you have recorded these separately at the time, it'll be easier for you, if there is any relief, um, to know what expenses you've incurred. Equally to that, it also allows you, when you are analyzing your financials, which we'll come on to properly, You'll also know this is extra stuff that we wouldn't have had to pay for otherwise. So if we take that out and look at what our, what our financial performance would have been otherwise, it's a better indication of how you're doing as a company if you're able to remove the stuff that's just related to COVID-19. Lastly, um, check your insurance policies. I've been surprised at the amount of clients that I've recommended this to who've looked and been happily surprised that they actually do have business disruption insurance as part of the insurance that they do have. Unfortunately, you do also have to look to see if there's a clause to exclude pandemics. And most of the people I've been dealing with, most of the time when they've had business disruption, there has been an exclusion clause for pandemics, but you never know. And I think it's fair to say that a lot of owners aren't actually sure what they are insured for. So it's worth, take a look um, and see. Okay, next one. Cash flow forecasting. It might sound daunting, it might sound boring, it might sound something that you don't need to do or you don't want to do, but 
I really, really implore you to do this. It's really going to help you. Um, it's going to help you understand your business. It's going to help you plan for the future. And there are ways of keeping it simple and not getting overwhelmed. And again, people, there's a lot of people that can help you with this if you just reach out. So I'd like you all to, if you haven't already, prepare a cash flow for the next 12 to 18 months. I don't want to be too negative. I want everyone to hope for the best, but you should prepare for the worst. So some assumptions that you can make in your cash flow forecasting. Just assume that curfews within Cayman are going to remain in place through to the end of June. So that your local business, you are not going to be able to perform as a local business any non-essential services till the end of June. Hopefully it will be before that, but at this stage we just don't know. Also, if you're affected by Cayman borders, assume that they will remain closed for the rest of the year. We are trying to forecast a worst case scenario to make sure that you can get through this time. So there's no point assuming the borders are going to open next month and then just have to change your plan when they don't. The third point, think about what will happen when the local market does open and it depends on your business. Is business going to go right back to normal with no, no effect in sales or revenue whatsoever? Are you going to have more sales and revenue because actually people have been waiting for you to reopen all this time? Or are you going to see a decrease? Remember that there's a lot of people who unfortunately are losing their jobs and are going to have to leave Ireland. So there's a big chance that your income might not be um, as much as what it was beforehand. And also pay particular attention to when larger amounts of money fall due in certain, certain months, especially with some of the government relief programs that are coming in now, which I'm going to go through later. They're brilliant for the short term to help you get through this. But at some point, you're going to have to pay all this money. And if you've not focused on that at all, when the time comes, you might find yourself unable to, to, to pay. So. Um, Examples of these are work permits, annual insurance renewal dates, they're just typical ones that each co every company has. And there are also others which you'll know from your company, you just need to be aware of. And also when, you, when you're doing your cash flows, don't forget to take into account your current payables, what you already owe. Uh, that's actually a fairly common mistake people make. They just look to the future and forget that they actually owe a chunk of money now. Also, be realistic. Um, I don't want to be too negative, but you are just going to kid yourself if you're not going to be if you're not going to be realistic, and if you're going to be too positive with your cash flows, then there's probably not much point in doing it. Be realistic, and when you're looking at the results, if you see that your cash is going to fall negative, it's really great to know now so that you can act now to put measures in place. So that when it happens, you're prepared and able to work through it, business as usual. So some of you might need an inflow of cash if your account is going to go negative. So possibilities of where that cash can come from could be from current owners. Um, it could be through new investors, either by people buying into your business or just through giving someone giving you a loan. Um, if someone gives you a loan, the benefits are that you're not having to share ownership of your company, but it's likely that the loan may have interest on it and may be payable at a certain time. So you then definitely have to think about how are you going to pay this loan back? If someone buys in equity, um, it does mean sharing your ownership. That's not always a bad thing. It might mean... Um, New, new people to share ideas with, new people to share the stresses of having a business with as well. But it does mean that you will have to share ownership. Um, but good news is, is that you also wouldn't have the loan repayment um, to make if someone's bought equity into your company. Okay, there's also uh, the government through their cuts that we're going to go, their relief efforts that we're going to go through later on and through the CICVD program that we talked about earlier. Um, there's cash to help you there, which is great. Also, if you're not eligible 
for the loan interest lo free interest loan through the CICBD, you may be eligible for a loan with a different bank. Um, you are going to have different terms, um, and it might be harder to get, but it's a possibility that needs to be considered. And also, this is the last point, but it probably should have been the first point. If you have a cash flow forecast, and you can see that you're going to go in the negative by just a small amount in three or four months time for just two months. If you have that cash flow forecast and it's realistic, you can talk to your bank today. They'll be impressed that you're planning, you know what's happening. They'll feel comfortable that you're in control of your finances and they may agree an overdraft facility with you. If it's agreed up front, you will probably avoid a lot of the fees that would be incurred if you just go negative without having a facility in place. Okay, I do have a basic cash flow forecast example on the next page. There is a lot of numbers on it. I'm not gonna go through it all. As I said previously, this is for you to have when you're at home trying to do your own, you can refer to this. Okay, but I will go through just some very quick things with you. You have your months along the top. I've only done six months, but you will do 12 months or even longer. You start with your cash inflows. You just list on a monthly basis what you realistically think your cash inflows, i.e. your sales, are going to be. If you have customers who you invoice and they pay you at a later date, don't forget to take that into account. For example, if I clean your pool in April, I might invoice you in May and you might have until the end of May to pay me. So in that situation, I wouldn't see the cash in April. So take that into account. Also, this is a good time with your customers. If you need money earlier, talk to them about changing the terms. If they can, hopefully they will agree that with you, help you out. So you have all the cash inflows at the top, which you then add together to get your total cash inflows over each month. And then you list your cash outflows. And you have to think on a month by month basis what actual cash is gonna go out the door. So don't worry about things like depreciation. That's not, that's not cash. Don't worry about that. And things like, for example, your work permit renewals, they are annual fees. So remember, they're not spread out over 12 months. So don't forget about things like that when they fall due. Add it up, you get the total cash outflows. And then at the bottom, we've got like the summary and this is what's really gonna help you. You've got the net cash inflow or outflow. Outflow is the negatives. So if you look at May as an example, you've got no inflow, no revenue coming in and your cash outflows you predicted you need to spend $9,050. So your net cash outflow for the month is negative $950. If you started with $12,000, like in this example, the closing cash balance in your bank account is going to be $2,950. So this closing cash balance then becomes your opening cash balance on the next month. You add up your inflows and your outflows for the next month. In this situation, negative 6,050 for June. If you've got 2,950 to start with and you spend 6,050, you're going to be at negative 3,100 to start at the end of the month. This is then the starting balance for the next month. I'll leave it at that. Um, I don't want this to be confusing. I don't want this to get too technical. If you want to do cash flow forecasts, your technical assistance can help you. You also have my email address and my number at the beginning and at the end of this presentation. Um, you also have a lot of professionals out there, a lot of accounting companies, um, a lot of the operational uh, guys who can help you. So reach out if you need help. But if you are intimidated by this, don't just not do it. That's not the answer. Get people to help you with it because this could be really crucial in helping you get through the next few months. Okay, now we're gonna go through some accounting and operational efficiencies. Um, this is a great time 
while things are slower, although it might be hurting you on a financial basis, there are some silver linings. This is a great time to check that your operational and accounting procedures that you have in place or don't have in place are efficient and are the right procedures for you. You also need to think about what is this new world going to be? What, when we come out of this other side, how are your clients going to have changed? How are your services? How do you need to change so that when you, we come out the other side, you're going to be able to flourish? This is a great time to think about that. Um, how many times in our lives have we actually wanted a breather from life? Have we wanted things to slow down? Have we wanted the ability to do all these things that we're too busy to do otherwise? Whether you enjoy it or not, I suspect for most of you, it's probably not, but they're so important to having a successful business um, and for reaching your true potential, really. So I'll go through a couple of things for you to consider from an accounting perspective and an operational perspective. There are no right answers here. All of your businesses are different. All of your situations are absolutely unique, but think about the answers to these questions. Okay, firstly, are your accounts up to date? Have you ever had accounts before? If not, and you're going through the loan program, this is a perfect opportunity, not just to get your accounts up to date because someone else is telling you to do it. Honestly, and I will say this because I'm, I'm an accountant, so I can't say anything else, but you can use that information to make good decisions for your business. Um, you, you have to focus forward. You can't spend too much time looking at what's gone behind and what's already happened, but you can learn so much from what has happened in the past. And how do you spot if your employees are misusing your credit card, misusing your expense accounts, if you don't actually allocate some time to looking at your accounts? So if your accounts are not up to date, you're going to have to bring them up to the date to get government support anyway, and then keep them up to date, either by you doing it, having your technical assistant helping you, hiring someone to do it for you, whatever is right for you, but make sure you're using that information as well. Um, if you do have accounting right now, are you using the most, account, most efficient procedures right now? There's so many times in the work life where you're doing something and each month you're doing the same thing and you know it's not the most efficient and you think next month I'll make it more efficient next month and next month rolls around and you're no less busy and you just don't get to it. Now is the perfect time to make those efficiencies. Um, also, just think about the software you're using. Online versus desktop. If you're still using QuickBooks Desktop, which I do love, if you're still using it though, it might not be the best option for you anymore. There are some great online platforms out there. They are cheap, they are easy to use, they're easy to understand, and they're really convenient. So whilst there might not be that much going on on the accounting side, this might be a great time um, to, to make a switch. So when things kick off again and you're all ready to go, you've got everything in place for that. Okay, some operational um, from an operational perspective, developing a business contingency plan. Uh, I'm sure that sounds like a yawn to most people, and I have to be honest, me too. Um, but it can be so helpful when you sit down and analyze something in an organized manner. You just come up with so much more valuable information than you did otherwise. Um, there are a lot of um, operational companies out there who can help you with this your technical assistance again will help you with this and it probably is going to be a requirement to get a loan um, so business continuity plan and then just think do you have the right people with you in the right positions in times when businesses are doing well like they have been for the last few years hopefully for a lot of you it's easy to well well you see cash coming in the door on a regular basis it's easy to not be efficient. It's easy to keep stuff on the payroll that you don't really need just out of habit or because you're being nice. Um, I'm not saying fire everybody. Um, it would put everyone all, all obviously in horrible position and it's not a nice thing to have to do, but 
if you're th talking about keeping your company alive in these times, you may have to make some difficult decisions and we'll go over some of that later on. Is your operational workflow as efficient as it could be? And this links with the last one about being appropriately automated. Do you have three different people doing exactly the same thing? Do you have to repeat tasks? While business is quiet, this is the time to think about this stuff. And um, there are a lot of apps out there. There's a lot of automation that you can do yourselves. And there are also a lot of people, professionals out there who do this for a living, who help people for a living. Um, we do this, all the accounting companies do this. There's also Savage Consulting who do this very well. So there are a lot of people out there that can help you if you're not sure on how to do it yourselves. And I, I think, I don't want to speak out of turn, but I think that the chamber may be doing more of an operational advice for you guys um, next week or, or in a few weeks. Um, I'm sorry if I've just started a rumor, I hope not. Okay, and this slide leads into the slide before. Take advantage of the slower time. It might be tough on you. Um, you might be panicking, but life doesn't slow down very much and use this time. You don't wanna come out at the end of this, get back in the busy life and then think, oh, I should have done this when it was quiet. I should have done this when it was quiet. And this isn't just for business. This is a time to be healthy, exercise, um, catch up with friends on your house party or your Zoom or whatever you're using. This time will pass and it might not come again. So where there are small silver linings that you can get from this, take advantage. So in terms of your business, just have a think, refocus. What is the mission statement of your business? What is your business supposed to be doing? Have you drifted from that? If the answer is yes, that's not necessarily a bad thing. It might be a great thing, but think about it. If you've got your financial analysis or when you get your financial analysis, look at your business lines. How profitable are each business line? You might be really profitable in three areas, but one area that's not being profitable can ruin it for everything else and mean that you're not breaking even or only just breaking even. Now's a great time to think about that. Key employees. Who are your key employees in your business? You may have to make some difficult decisions. You may have to let some people go, but really think who are the people that matter to your business? Who cares about your business? And don't automatically think that firing them is the answer. You might have some really loyal employees. You might have some employees who are financially advantaged enough that they can accept a reduced pay during this time. Um, I would say taking care of your employees is a number one right now. If you need to let people go, make the decision sooner rather than later. Um, look after your employees where you can, but if you are hurting, your employees may be able to help you with that. Um, think of them as, as a vendor. If you need to ask them to take pay cuts, um, I'm sure they will understand in this time. Um, don't be unfair. Uh, this is people's lives we're talking about, but it's worth considering and what you need to do to keep your company alive um, must come first as long as you're being fair. Okay, and then think about, I touched on this before, think about what the new normal is going to look like. When Cayman opens its borders, borders towards the end of year, or even internally, um, What's it going to look like? For example, if you are in the tourist industry and you rely solely on tourism, you're, um, the new normal, say from May or June or July, when the borders are closed, but we're, people within Cayman are able to move around hopefully freely, how can you position your business for the, the local market, not the tourist market? Um, normal as we know it might be gone forever. It might not get back until next year. So think about your business, think about what you offer. Um, phone up your loyal clients. Off, you could offer them discounts if they want to pay for um, 10 manicures up front. Um, they pay now, they can get a 10% discount and then they can use it when you reopen. Little things like this you can help just 
with cash flow right now. Bear in mind, if you do do that and people are paying you up front now, you are going to have to service them down the line and not get funds for it. So that's all part of your cash flow planning as well. And then lastly, consider whether your business functions are better served by full-time, part-time employees or by outsourcing. If you think that your business is going to take a long time to recover from this, you may want to consider outsourcing. Um, outsourcing can be flexible. The hours can go up and down when you need and you don't have to pay pension and vacation. And then when you're ready and in a position to take on those part-time or full-time employees again, it's a way of stepping back in um, to business as usual. So think about these things, think what's best for your company. And then should my business weather the crisis at all? Um, we are gonna see casual business casualties in this time. If you're going to be a casualty of this business, don't panic and make that rash decision without really thinking about it. But if that is gonna happen, if you, if you cannot keep going as you are or the cost cutting measures that you can do are not gonna be good enough, face it now. It's not the end of the world. It's not necessarily a bad thing long-term. Um, these times are sent to try us but ignoring it is not gonna help you. It's probably gonna cost you and your employees more in the long run. So again, don't make the rash decisions about closing, closing, but be sensible, talk to advisors, talk to accountants, talk to operational specialists, talk to anyone that you know, friends, family, even competitors if you have good relationships. But if the outlook does not look feasible, you don't have an obligation to carry on your business as hard as it might be. You have to do what, what, what you think is the right thing with the information you have. Um, some options though, and this first one might sound like a bad option, but actually might be a great option. Perhaps you'd like to join forces with a competitor. If you join forces with a competitor, you get ego aside, <laughs> be careful, but you could get two heads are better than one. Uh, economies of scale because you only have to rent one place, you only have one electricity bill. If there's not enough demand in the economy, then su supply has to decrease. If you have a good relationship, it might be an option for you. Be wary, it could go wrong. Um, it's obviously I'm not recommending this necessarily, but is definitely something you could think about. Secondly, you could sell your business to a competitor. Might be a difficult time to do this. Your price might be underinflated. Um, but if you have loyal customers, you just can't service them yet, and you have this book of business, you could think about selling that to a competitor. You haven't gone out of business because you don't have customers. It's be possibly because of COVID-19 and you just couldn't get through the time that you needed to. So again, it's an option out there. Uh, thirdly, and I know a lot of businesses are doing this, hibernate your business. Um, you have a trade and business license already. You probably have your work permits. You don't necessarily need to re renew yet. What costs can you reduce? Shut up shop, only have the minimum cost you can. Preservation so that when it's the time, the right time for you to open, which might not be as soon as we're allowed to roam free, it might be later, it might be not until tourists come back, it's gonna be on a case by case basis, hibernate as much as you can. Um, and then lastly, obviously, option that you do need to consider um, might be to close your business. Um, again, it's better to make these decisions informed talk to professionals, talk to people who can help you through it, even if it's just um, talking it out with somebody else. Um, you don't want to regret making any decisions. So um, all we can do is make what we think is the right choice at the time. So I don't think anyone, this is unprecedented. No one should beat themselves up um, right now for not knowing what the best course of action is. Okay, 
Moving on, also a relatively gloomy slide, I'm afraid, but hopefully some um, interesting and helpful information on here for you. So employee leave, severance, and then pay. It's really important that you are all keeping up to date with your obligations. They are changing at the moment quite rapidly in order to help you, which is good, but I'm going to run through what things currently are. There could be something different next week or the week after. So don't just rely on my slides for the next five months because uh, things might change. And that's why I've put a lot of links in here so you can keep being updated. Okay, firstly, and obviously important, make sure you're still adhering to all the Cayman laws um, and employment contracts. You can't simply forget about your obligations in this time. Um, be mindful, according to the law, you're supposed to remit employees' wages within one month of wages being earned to, in order to avoid incurring an offence. That's in the law, but obviously these are difficult times. I would encourage you, if you're having difficulty, speak to your employees, be honest with them, um, um, be fair to them, and hopefully they'll be fair to you. Employees are entitled to earn vacation leave, sales, any commission or gratuities that they've earned. That hasn't changed in these times. Quick word on severance, if any of you are having to think about severance pay. So your obligation is that severance is one week's pay for every year of completed service. So if your employee has worked for you for two years and 11 months, your obligation is for the two years, so that would be two weeks severance pay. You can round it up to three years if you want, um, depending on your circumstance, but the law is that you round it down, so it's the years of completed service. Also, severance is to be paid to employees being laid off, and this I think is something to bear in mind. Unless the employees are going to come back to work within 30 days, that's most industries, or if you're in the construction or agriculture industries, that's actually six months. So if you are just, if you're not laying people off um, officially, you've got six months after which time they are considered to be um, formally terminated with you and you'll have to pay the severance pay so if someone goes in the construction industry off for five months and then come back it's not a new employment you can use the same contract and you wouldn't have to pay severance on that um caveat all of this i am not a lawyer um, i'm going by what i've read in my research if you are facing any of these difficult decisions get the right advice speak to a lawyer, speak to an immigration lawyer. There are a lot of great ones out there. Um, don't simply rely on a slide pack from an accountant. Okay. Um, employees being terminated by the employer, you do have to pay them what they're due. So any accrued vacation, notice pay, gratuities that are owed, you, you still do have to pay them. You have an obligation to pay them those. And also notice pay is separate severance pay. I've had that question quite a few times. Um, it is different. If you have notice pay in the contract, it's separate from severance and you do have to pay it based on what your contract says, employment contracts. If the contract is silent, the notice pay is considered to be the interval between paydays. So if you pay on a monthly basis, your notice pay is a month. If you pay on a, a bi-weekly basis, your notice period is one bi-weekly um, pay interval. Health insurance. If you do uh, make people redundant at this time, you do fire people at this time, you do have an obligation to continue to provide health insurance for your employee for the next three months. This does not have to be an expense of the company you can withhold all of the monies from the employee in their final paycheck, but you as the employer do have an obligation to make sure that the employee does have health insurance for three months after they're terminated. This obligation does in certain circumstances end before the three months is up. If 
the employee becomes employed elsewhere on Ireland and then the obligation will shift to the new employer. If the employee becomes otherwise insured, perhaps they go on to their spouse's health insurance, for example, or if they just get health insurance independently, or lastly, if the employee leaves Ireland. And then a quick note on if you're thinking about reducing salaries and wages, uh, there are links to this. Um, you must ensure you're compliant with the minimum wage order and also there is the national minimum basic wage which is six dollars an hour for most businesses um, that's still in effect throughout this time you can't just ignore that for any wage rate for service employees or which has a gratuity scheme the rate is actually 450 and there are also different rates maybe for live-in household domestics or employees in a commission basis so if you're in any of those unique situations um, I do have the link right there. You can go and check it out for yourself what your specific obligations are. But these obligations under the law, they don't stop now because of COVID and because of the other re relief measures that are being put in place. These obligations do still stand. And more importantly, I would say, um, from reading, from what I've read in the law, it seems to be a, a message that you can't force this on your employees your employees have to agree if you want to reduce their, their rate for the same amount of work. Um, speak to them, be honest, be fair. Don't try and profit from these times. These people have food to put on the table, they have families. But if you need them to take a cut so that in a few months time, there's still a job to go back to, um, hopefully they will work with you. Um, but I think as well, have a conversation. No one likes to just be told this, this bad thing is happening to you. You're going to have to take a pay cut. Reason with people, explain to them, um, maybe look at your cash flow. Can you offer them incentives in the future if and when you get through this? Um, but just talk to people, I think, is, is my advice. Um, everyone understands what everyone's going through here. Okay, hopefully this is, I've left this to last because I think it's probably going to be everyone's favorite section. Um, what assistance has the government announced so far? So firstly, trade and business licenses. Um, if you have like, uh, late fees um, that are due because you haven't renewed your trade and business license yet during this period that government's been closed for, you won't have to pay late fees. Um, also, your payment of your trade and business license application fee is waived from 1st of May to 31st of June. So that's just the application fee, which I believe is $75. It's not the actual um, payment for your trade and business license. That hasn't been waived. Um, there's a link there for more information on the trade and business license temp temporary reduction in fees. Um, but I believe the government are enabling soon um, the ability to pay online for most of these things that have been on hold for the last few weeks can now be paid online. Trade and business license, you're going to be able to submit and you can submit trade and business licenses online. Uh, you will have to pay for them, but the application fee is waived. Work permits. Um, the government, one of the laws put through just last night in the Legislative Assembly affects this. Um, the, um, if you have an employees and their work permit comes up for renewal at this time, for the last few weeks, you weren't able to pay or renew. You can now and you have to now. You're obliged to pay online and file the forms electronically online. Um, you won't need a police clearance. You won't need a medical certificate, but you will have to do this online. You can't just ignore work permit, the renewals of work permits anymore. There is a 30-day grace period for people whose permits expired in the last month. Now that the new process is being established, they're not going to penalize you for anything that's happened in the last month. And they are also creating the forms online for you to fill in. That's not ready yet. So you can't rush out today and, and renew your work permits. Um, they are going to let us know when that's up and running, but I think it's going to be very soon. Also on advertising, um, this was coming into effect anyway, it's not to do with COVID, um, but the government has created 
an online jobs portal where now we all employers will have to advertise online whereas previously you just had to advertise in the paper now it is going to transition to online um, you can still advertise in the paper if you'd like um, but it's now going to be an obligation going forward to also um, apply online if you are imminently having to apply for a work permit um, don't panic people understand that this is a new process um, the the rules are unclear for a lot of people um, reach out to one of the um, HR service providers um, just for advice free advice I'm sure they'll be happy to help you on what the actual process is going to be but don't ignore your work permits coming up for renewal which I think is what a lot of people were kind of doing in the past month because there was nothing to do you do now unfortunately have obligations again permanent residency fees same thing if anyone has permanent residency fees your annual fee coming up um, you can pay online and you should be paying online and you can also you're going to be able to submit your annual declarations online as well pension so importantly I'm sure you're all aware there is now a pension contribution holiday the law was passed uh, yesterday evening so is now in effect there's a six-month pension holiday so it's operating retroactively from 1st of April so my interpretation of this is from 1st of April the wages and salaries that your employees incur for the next six months you do not have to deduct pension from them and you do not have to contribute to pension yourself if you do choose this you want this email your pension provider informing them that you're going to take advantage of this but you do also need to inform your employees as well um, don't leave them in the dark on this let them know what what is going on and that's going to last for six months and then secondly withdrawal of pension contributions this law was also passed yesterday so anybody who has an active pension account i.e you're working and you're paying pension contributions and you're not if you're not retired um, you will be able to withdraw funds from your pension account i believe you have until 30th of october to do this and you will get if your balance current balance is less than ten thousand you can take all of that ten thousand if your current contribution balance in your pension fund is more than ten thousand you can take out the first ten thousand and then up to twenty five percent of any of the remaining balance above the ten thousand so i've put a quick example in here now if you had a hundred thousand in your pension fund you can get the first 10k plus 25 percent of the remaining 90,000 so the total you would be able to withdraw is 32,500 um, this is an option for both Caymanians and non-Caymanians um, but it's not accessible for people who have retired already or people who left Cayman before February 1st 2020 there is a word of warning on this your pension is there for a reason it's there because at some point hopefully you'll be old enough that you don't want to work and you don't have to work if you take all of your pension out and you do not replace it by the time you retire your pension fund may be not enough to keep you going through pension so do do not take this lightly don't think of it as free money to spend willy-nilly if you need this to help your business survive this is a great resource to help you do that but be conscious if you do take this and you plow it into your business and your business does not survive you don't have it you wouldn't have a business and you also wouldn't have your pension fund so it is it is a great option for some people out there but everybody is unique um, don't waste this opportunity by making a, by making the wrong decision for you just because all your friends might be withdrawing it um just think about it properly and again if you're not sure reach out to um any professionals who can help you um speak to your 
pension provider as well. Speak to your friends, your family, and your peers. Okay, mortgages. The banks are offering a repayment holiday, which is enabling you to defer your residential mortgage payments. Um, I think a couple of banks, different banks are dealing with this differently. I've heard that some banks are doing this automatically, giving you a pension holiday. For some banks, you have to actually ask them. Make sure you know uh, the situation with your bank. Um, this is for if your business is affected right now and your cash flow is, is down, this is a great thing that can help you. Um, but beware, your interest will continue to accrue on your mortgage. So in the end of the day, 20 years down the line, when you finish paying off your mortgage, because you took this holiday and you accrued interest in the meantime, the total that you pay back to the bank will increase slightly. Um, do your own analysis on that, um, whether you want to take the mortgage holiday or not. If you're struggling with cash flow for your business, this is, a, this is um, a fantastic opportunity to make some savings. But if you really don't need to do this, um, it's not necessarily the best thing for you in the long term. And then a word of warnings in the bottom. And take this into account in your cash flow forecasts. When the government are coming out with these things that will help you, um, and that some of them are absolutely great and they will help you in the short term, do not forget that Cayman will open up again and you will start to have more obligations again. Um, so in your cash flows and your savings plan, take that into account. You will have to pay some fees at some point later on that maybe you're getting breaks on now. So don't just ignore the, the consequences of taking advantage of these breaks. Okay, we've got, I won't go through this, but you have a lot of useful websites and contacts on this slide. The first two, really important. If you want to take advantage of the loan or of the grant program that CICBD are doing, there's the two email addresses on here for you to email and start the process. Simply email one each if you want the loan on the grant email both separately say introduce yourself give them just the the a quick description of your company um and then they'll get back to you with what else you need to do with the form that you need to fill in and some of the other requirements um if you're thinking about doing all this act now send them an email uh, you're not tied in as soon as you send them an email but educate yourself and learn more about the options out there and then there's also the government COVID-19 information page is really helpful. Um, I spent quite a long time on it yesterday and I was really pleasantly surprised. A lot of questions that people have been ringing me and asking me are answered on there. So please go on, take a look um, at all of these links um, and see, we, I can't cover everything for all the businesses in here, but these are really useful. Okay, finally, I just also would like to say that everybody is in this together. Um, these are hard times for everybody. Some people are suffering more than other, others. And I think what I've seen so far is really, really lovely. I've seen people helping other people. Um, and not so far, I haven't seen people taken advantage of it. If you are in a position where you're financially fortunate, do not take advantage of people who are less so. If you're in a position as a company to give some of the smaller companies longer to pay, maybe some discounts, this is the time when you should be doing that. Um, they will be loyal to you when, when we get through this, I hope. Um, don't try and profit from this in the short term. Uh, it's not gonna help anybody in the long run. Um, and stay safe, stay kind. Stay at home. Uh, thank you all for joining. I hope that was useful. I've got my contact details up there for you, and I believe we'll move forward with any questions that we might have. Well, thank you very much, Lauren. That was really a great, very thorough presentation. Really appreciate the time you've spent and really helping us out with a lot of questions. I see Spencer Daniel Bennett has his hand up. I'm going to unmute his mic, and if he wants to ask his question, Go ahead. 
Spencer? Yes, sir. Go ahead, and you had a question, I, I think. How, yeah, I was wondering how do I apply for uh, to start with this grant and maybe for the loan? Yes, absolutely. Uh, if I go back one slide, sorry, I think I interrupted you there. I'll let you finish in a second. If I go back one slide, you'll see the first two email addresses, one for the loan and the second one uh, for the grant. Just email those each, say you're interested, and they'll get back to you with the information that, that they need with those. Okay, I don't know how to go back. How do I go back? Um, can you see my slideshow still? Um, no. No. Ah. Well, these, this, uh, let me, I'll read it out to you, but you are going to get copies of the slide pack as well. So it will be on there, but the email address is quite simple. So I'll read them to you. Okay. Uh, for the loan, it's loan mm -hmm. dot CICBD. Mm -hmm. Yeah, at gov dot KY. Make sure me one more time. So that's loan.cicbd at gov.ky. Uh, and the grant is exactly the same, but instead of the word loan, you put grant. So grant.cicbd at gov.ky. Um, just be aware that they're getting probably thousands of emails a day. I don't know. So they may take a little time to get back to you, trying to filter through all the emails, but um, they will get back to you. If you don't hear back from them in a few days, I would suggest sending a chaser just in case your emails got lost. Um, but do, but do be, be patient with them and give them a bit of time to get back to you. If anybody else has any question, you just uh, raise your hand in the chat and I'll open your mic. I don't see, let's see through the chat. I don't, um, I think Michael asked, Michael Brandon asked a question to everybody. Are the forms available yet? I'm not sure which forms he's talking about. Yeah. Are you talking I, about pension forms? Because that that's uh, probably something that's going to be probably put together by the administrators now that the law has been passed. No, he's saying the loan forms. Um, yes, I believe that they are in order to get, there's a checklist that they will give you of what you need to send to them. To get that, you need to email them at the loan.cicbd at gov.ky email address, and they will send you the form. Same for the grant. They'll send you the form for the grant as well. Okay. Does anybody else uh, raise your hand if you have a question? Either everybody's asleep. <laughs> or my presentation answered everybody's questions. Let's well, pretend. What I'll, what I'll do with uh, what I'll do is is I will I will unmute unmute some of the mics. I'll allow you guys to you know come on and see if you had any questions. I just wanted to control the number of people trying to ask Lauren questions all at one time. So I'll allow everyone to unmute themselves. So if you have a question, please raise them now. I have a Gregory Watt has a question. Gregory, go ahead, Greg. Well, actually, it's not a question. I just want to take the time to say um, the opportunity to say thank you so much for this very comprehensive presentation. It has been very informative. And so I do appreciate it. Thank, thank you much. Good. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thanks so much. Alfred Benjamin. Hi, Alfred. Hi. Thank you very much. Um, I wonder if you can. Lauren, sorry. I wonder if you can go back to that slide in which you were showing some details of the kinds of analyses that you ought to be doing when applying for a loan, please. Uh, yes. Can you still see my slides? I can. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so there uh, was yeah. this one. No, no, no. It's the one where, where you were showing the, the downloads from, from your banking account. Ah. Uh, where there is a, you know. This one? Debit credit, debit credit description of, of ah. activity. Yeah. <laughs> I know which one you mean. This one. 
Yeah. Um, first of all, I'm not so sure whether whether the the, the online online uh, printouts that that we can get from the bank will carry these detailed descriptions of, of the activity. Um, and because of that, or, or if they do, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't a CVS uh, analysis which shows, you know, date, amount, credit, debit, would that not be sufficient for this kind of, of requirement? I think, yeah, thank you for the question. I think that in the initial stages, at least for the grant, I think that it would be sufficient. Um, the, the ladies from the CICBD are on, so feel free to jump in anytime if, if I misrepresent. But I think initially just a download would be enough. But if you're applying for the loan and through the technical assistance program, you are going to have somebody who helps you to create financial records is going to be a requirement. And this sort of analysis is really going to help them um, with that. If this is not something that you feel is kind of feasible for you to do, then, um, you know, everybody is an individual case. Speak to the CICBD about your situation. Um, speak to your technical assistant and they will advise on the best method to do. This is my suggestion this is what i would be doing if i if i were you guys um this is what i would be doing thank you for 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 that answer and i'm trying also to to understand if you have this kind of of information uh coming from from your bank why is it necessary for for you to also have receipts from your from your vendors yeah i think that um the initial request from ci uh, CBD is for receipts and that's because they understand that um, most of the or a lot of the companies probably won't have any financial records whatsoever and may have a box of receipts I think it's I think they're trying to just get across that um, it doesn't matter if you just have a box of receipts we can work with them um, and then from my interpretation through being one of the people who are hopefully going to help in this program, like a lot of the accountants on Ireland are, when I've been thinking about what will I do when someone comes to me and I'm going to help them. And instead of me sitting through a box of receipts and putting them in a spreadsheet, that's not what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask them for their, for their bank download. So the box of receipts, I think, is just an example of it doesn't matter how rudimentary your accounts are, as long as you have something and your bank statement is actually perfect for this because it shows your business activity. And a lot of people though might be running their company accounts through their personal accounts. So if you download your personal accounts, it might be very difficult to distinguish between what's personal and business. And that's, I think, where the box of receipts might come in. And, and even better than that, if you reach back out to your vendors and ask them for the activity statements, I think that's going to be really helpful information just to show the CICBD. Look, I am a company. I'm not just Joe Blogs trying to get money off you. I am a company. I have expenses. I have been affected by COVID-19. And that's really what they're trying to get across in the first instance. And if, and if, you, have, if you have been transferring this uh, information uh, into a QuickBooks format uh, where you can run a profit and loss, uh, statement for for one year, two years, as the case may be, would would that be advantageous? Yes, that would be. This what I've done here is the basic. If you can download, and really, if you're going to use QuickBooks for this, if you don't have financial statements records before, you really want to consider using a cloud platform. So QuickBooks Online or Zero, both are great. You can download your bank statements into CSV Excel, upload them into the accounting software. And then if you've already done this spreadsheet and you've got the accounts by the side, you can code it so it automatically puts anywhere where you've put revenue, will automatically put it into revenue for you. So if you do do this analysis, it makes an upload very, very simple and quick. 
you don't, if you're going to upload it, you don't have to do this fourth column, the financial account column. You can just go by the bank description. And then when you upload it, just one by one, um, put things where you want them to be. But if you can upload them to an online platform, whoever you get as your technical assistant is going to love you forever. Well, thank you very much for that, Lauren. You're welcome. Hi, uh, this here from Cutting Edge. Um, Kevin here. I did observe possibly the same thing that this application became a bit intrusive, where they wanted to know a little bit too much just for a grant. Nevertheless, we were fortunate because we do work, run QuickBooks, and we did have receipts, etc. But I could only imagine what the application for the loan is going to look like if the grant was that much. Um, the amount of information they required for the grant. I can only imagine how much they're going to require for the loan. Um, I've done the grant process with a few of my clients now, and I actually thought the grant process that we that I've taken my clients through was actually very reasonable. Or perhaps you did too much. What we did for, for the grant that I've done is we filled out the application form, which, which wasn't that hard we downloaded financial statements for the last two years even though it just said it was three months worth of bank statements and i think 12 months of bookkeeping records we downloaded the bank statements for two years i spent only two hours doing this excel that i've just showed you and we sent them that and then we sent them some vendor statements and that really was all that the grant required. Um, and I even think doing the Excel analysis that I did for the grant was probably more than was necessary. Um, I, think, I, I think that when applying for the loan, that's when the real financial analysis is actually gonna, gonna come in. Um, you are going to have to be able to produce with, with help of someone, a P&L, for the last two years at some point. Um, so that, that might be tricky for a lot of businesses. I think you're really gonna have to rely on the support that the CICBD and your technical assistant can give you. If, if I may respond as well. Sure. Althea Westmeyers from the Center for um, Business Development. The process for um, accessing the loan is quite simple. We are merely trying to establish that a business has been in, in existence and has been actively engaging the market for the last 12 months. So as proof of that, as evidence of that, we're asking you to provide us with three months bank statements and evidence, tran bank, um, business transactions. Those can be invoices, those can be receipts. It doesn't have to be a, a financial statement of any sort. Just evidence that you have been actively engaging the market for the last 12 months. That's, that's all we're asking for. That's for the grant, Althea, correct? That's for the grant, yes. Um, I saw Cash before had his hand up. Cash, did you have a question? It's gone all, it's gone all shy. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, hi Cash. Hey, uh, I was sorry, I've joined the, um, the presentation a bit late. I'm not sure whether you covered anything in it, but it's probably a difficult question for you to cover. Um, we recently set up a business, it's less than a year old. Obviously from our perspective and based on all the guidelines that have been set by the CICBD, um, there is no real um, outlet for us to go to for the government because we're a new business. And I'm just wondering if there's anything, I mean, you know, I, I know there's a few other people on this, on this chat that might be better understanding of new businesses, you know, that might be able to assist a bit more. And if there isn't anything that you can guide new businesses on, because we're obviously in a uncharted territory. It's, it's you know, obviously um, very, very difficult times for everyone. Um, and we've, I mean, I've basically put all my life savings into my business. And I literally have, you know, you know whatever cash flow I have left, I have left, you know, and, and with the exception of the pension, you know, break that we have, there's, you know, there's very little outlet for me to reach out to in a sense. And I'm just wondering if there's anything that you can maybe 
you know, guide us on, you know, if there's anything Gosh, else. Without getting into too many specifics about your business, do you feel as though uh, if the country was to reopen for our domestic economy within two, two to three months, uh, is there still a, 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 you know, think a demand for your services? Uh, yes, I think there's a demand for the services for sure, because I think we wouldn't have uh, opened up the business if we right. didn't, there was a demand for it. Um, I think the, the difficult thing that I have, which I did contact CICBD for, was um, the fact that we have, yes, been in operation since uh, December. We had our trade and business license in August. Um, and obviously, we've had a lot of costs that go with that. And we've opened up. We've had a, a relatively good start to the business. You know, as in we've, we've, we're building our database up. We're, we're providing a service that is you know, again, we think are very different and what came is missing. So we've done everything in terms of strategy wise to do the right thing. And, you know, based on uh, obviously the lack of, um, I suppose, support, you know, I understand the, the justifications for it because, you know, new businesses are always going to be a, low, a high risk factor, which is what they, they outlined in my email response um, that, you know, because of a high risk factor, they're not going to be supporting. Yeah. Yeah. Then my suggestion to would you, my suggestion I can't would be you have to have a good discussion with your bank. Yeah. Right. You, you've got to, you really have to have a sit down discussion with them, mm -hmm. show them that you feel your business is very viable and that once the economy reopens, they can give you some leeway uh, with regard to providing assistance at this time. I think that's probably your best course because you don't qualify right now because mm. your business is less than a year. Yeah. So, and again, I, I would encourage you to, to list, tune into different webinars that we offer. I'm actually going to be trying to get retail banks to come on to a webinar so that people who cannot maybe get access through some of the grants that the government and loan, then we will, we will definitely see if they would answer your questions in a webinar. Thanks for your question. Yeah, can I, can I just add to that as well? Um, uh, I feel for you, Cash, and I think there's quite a lot of people in your situation, and it's a scary place to be. Um, I think that what Will said about um, speaking to your bank is, is the number one thing to do. I'm sure you've done that already. Um, other suggestions, they're not perfect suggestions because you, you, you're only doing it because they're in the situation, but there are always people in Cayman that want to invest in businesses. Um, a lot of people are struggling, but there are people who are cash rich and um, would like to invest in your business. Um, you have the difficulty of sharing ownership, um, things like that to consider. Uh, potential of getting a private loan from, from a person as well, if you have any contacts. Um, and also, while speaking to your bank, uh, like Will suggested, there's the loan suggestion. Also, just the overdraft suggestion. Depends how long this is going to be. But if you do have a good business, like you've just opened your business. So I don't know what sort of business plans or stuff you have. But anything that you did do to start your business will still be so relevant um, if you want to pitch and hopefully get, get people to invest in your business if you have to. Um, another option is the hibernation option, if you can. Um, I don't know how much financial analysis that you're, you're doing, but um, it's tough. Yeah, absolutely. The next one is Trent, you had your hand up. Do you have a question, Trent? Uh, the previous caller answered just about everything I had. I'm in pretty much the same boat. So uh, I appreciate your presentation and thank you very much. Thanks, Trent. So can I just ask, um, you said you mentioned the hibernation program what what does that entail tom can yeah it's sorry it's not a program it's just my way of saying shut up shop as much as you can okay. if you say um i don't know if say your company relied on tourism for example obviously i don't know and you don't think tourism is going to come back until next year can you give up your lease, your rent lease. Um, you're not in your office, so you're not using it just your water. If you, if you just hired somebody who started a month ago, sorry, I have to let you go. What, how can you just go to sleep as much as you can and have minimum costs okay. until you're able to wake up? Um, 
quite difficult because we don't know when wake up is going to be yes exactly. case and you could cancel your lease on a fantastic property and then in in one month want it again and you've kind of missed the opportunity so we do have the uncertainty uh, of all those kind of things but um okay yeah and see how you can use this time to really work on all those new business things have you got the right policies and procedures in place have you got your accounting in place are you automated in those first few months what went wrong what did you learn so that you're going to hit the ground running and kill it when when you can yeah yeah that's fair enough yeah cool thank you so thank much Lauren. appreciate it oh, good michael, luck. Brandon, michael brandon you have your hand up Do you want a question yeah, sorry. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, you mentioned like Savage Consulting and a few other firms to help with um, the business analysis. Can you remind me what the other ones were? Uh, I guess it's difficult. There's so many good businesses who, who do this. I think the best thing for you to do, if you Google, say, accounting, HR, operational consultant, you're going to get a good list of them. Um, I wouldn't want to single out people to get business on a phone call with 200 yeah, people. I, I think that's the chamber. If you reach out to the chamber, we certainly have a list of businesses that we can, we can refer you to so that, uh, cause again, it's, it's about what you can afford as well, because there are different types of businesses that provide different types of services. So Michael, if you're interested, we're more than happy to put you in touch with a couple of them. All right. Thank you. No problem. Um, I think Marjorie and Ebanks had a question. You have your hand up. Yes. Um, I was asking about the pension. Um, I just want to make sense about that. Um, you were saying that it counts for people that left the island or leaving on uh, February 20th or something like that. You were saying um, we're actually quarantined right now in the Philippines and we can't get home. We were supposed to return home on the 27th of March, but we got locked in here. So... Um, I was wondering, because I have a pension with uh, PSPB, and they would send me stuff that's saying that I can't get a pension or I'm not able to get the pension because it's Public Service Pension Board. I wonder if, um, yeah, are you, you a civil servant? No, I actually resigned since September last year. Well, the law just passed, and they have excluded uh, public servants from from accessing the public service pension fund. If you have a private pension fund, uh, you should probably contact your pension provider. Um, the, and again, explain the circumstances that you were supposed to come back to the island, but you were unable to come back. And hopefully uh, they'll, they'll understand and you can probably get access. Are you intending to come back? I am, <laughs> we're quarantined. Yeah, I but I mean, the fact about it, um, when you said um, excluded, you're talking about I cannot get the government one. You I wouldn't be able to get my pension. That's correct. Yeah, correct. Why, why is that? That's what I want to make sense about. Why is that? I mean, we still human well, beings here. We we in this mess too. No, no, I completely and understand. The challenge that we sorry. have was that's what the government put in place. I mean. Uh, you know, we, we certainly, we put our two cents in and they only accepted what they thought was best for the country at the time. But if you do have access to a, a private pension plan, if you have some assets, then you can always apply to those plans. I see um, a, a number here. Three can, I just add, can I just add to that, Will, just Go quickly? Ahead. Um, I think that the reason why the government have done that is because um, for the moment, and they haven't said that's the rule forever. They, they right. have the ability to revise this if they want to, but for now, they've said government jobs are safe and people have just had a pay rise. So that's their rationale. Your specific case, the law is put in place as the law, but I think it can't harm you to reach out and explain your situation to the people making the laws so that they might put in some provisions um, if they think that it's a sensible thing to do in the future. But for now, it's just a blanket. If you're in the public um, service, no pension withdrawals. Sharon, I see your hand up. Sharon Hurd, I yeah. have the mic. 
Okay. Um, my, the completed uh, grant, what's the best way to submit that? Is it by email? I suspect it would require several email um, messages. Um, no, for the grant, it shouldn't do. Um, the application form is just, it's one and a half pages long. Um, it's not complicated. And then the bank, they're asking for bank statements and a couple of your vendor bills. It's just so that you can show them examples that you are a business spending money in the market. You don't have to send them everything that you have. So um, for the ones that I've done, it's just been one email with some examples in. Um, if, if you don't give them enough, they can come, always come back to you and ask for more information. Uh, but but the, for the grant, it shouldn't, be, it shouldn't be more than one email. Okay, thank you. There's somebody's hand is up for a telephone number, and it's 321-6436898. Do you have a question? Hello? Go ahead, you have a question? Yeah, sorry, I'm not uh, too sure if I'm on, I can't see, but I'm trying to understand the, the difference between the government guarantee as opposed to just a not just applying for a loan. What, what, if this is a government guaranteed loan, um, the requirements are the same. If, if you're going to borrow, just go, you know, and borrow, borrow from the CIDB the same way. So I'm just trying to understand what, what makes this, is this a particular, you know, government guaranteed loan or is this, at this point, it seems it's the same requirements that you would, you would normally use for just a regular loan if you were applying without the government guarantee behind it. Yeah, there are, thank you for your question. Uh, there are some differences. Althea, I don't know if you're best placed to respond to this, otherwise I can, I can have a go and you can correct me if I'm wrong. I'm not sure where she is. Um, so I'm here, but I think Tracy probably would be the best person to answer that question. I'm not certain. CIDB, um, would you like to take that question? Yeah, I'm still here. This is Tracy from the CIDB. Uh, I, I was following some of the chat discussions because I think there is a, a general misunderstanding as to security requirements and what the government guarantee is actually all about. The government guarantee is simply in support of the CIDB bank. In the event that some of these loans aren't repaid, the government is providing that guarantee to the bank. This has nothing to do with the security requirements of the applicant. The bank is doing loans utilizing 80% loan to value. So if you need $50,000, if you have an asset that's worth 62,500, then you can get the whole entire $50,000. So I think there's been a, a misconception there that government is guaranteeing a portion of the loan. That is not the case. It's just like if you if you were getting a mortgage and the property was um, being sold for $100,000 and banks typically finance 90% for a, a mortgage, then you would have to put in $10,000. It's the same principle here, it's, it's just 80%. The average commercial bank typically looks at 65% loan to value for business loans because they're considered a lot more risky, but we're taking that um, ratio all the way up to 80. So in a normal yeah. time with CIDB, what, is the what would be the requirements? What, what would be the security deposit? Or sorry, I should say, what would be the security? And you, you just said that if you have assets of six to two thousand, you can borrow fifty thousand. Correct. You know, so kind of a simple mind like me, I'm wondering if I have six to two thousand, then fifty thousand is something that um, you know, it's a why if I have six to two, I wouldn't be asking to borrow fifty. But what I'm trying to understand is like at this point, what what would be if I went to CIDB tomorrow without this grant in place or this uh, government initiative in place? What is the difference um, being offered now, other than the bank is getting secured, the CIDP is being very secured, even though there is, it's still everything is still the same. Where, where if, if I said I want to borrow a hundred thousand, does the does the criteria change, or you would tell me I need to come up with, um, I need to still come up with twenty percent, um, um, 
what do you call it? Um, um, in terms of um, having assets, I would still have to come with 20, uh, 20, 000, sorry, 20 percent. So I'm trying to understand it's limiting to 50,000 based on this. But at the same time, if you know, if, is it is there no application, for example, for 100,000, 75,000? Is there a difference in the requirements? Well, we do have an existing small business loan program um, that we can avail a little bit higher, up to $100,000. Um, and the ratio there is 75% loan to value. It's, it's 5% less. But well, we no, that's, that's kind of what I'm trying to ask because I'm saying if it's just limited, if I still have to come up with the same requirements for 50,000, then obviously if there's, if there's enough assets together to put together, then 50,000 will get you through maybe a month or two if even. But you know, if you're gonna think about a business in terms of three months, another couple of, um, couple of months, then just sticking it to 50,000 could end up just being a band-aid as opposed to trying to keep it going properly. Yeah, and I, I appreciate where you're coming from with that because the whole point of partnering with the Small Business Center with the money that we've earmarked for this program is essentially to help those people that, that Ms. Lauren pointed out that maybe doesn't have any technical savvy, they don't have established banking relationships, they don't have financial statements. So the Small Business Center is going to handhold and help these customers get all this information together so that when it, it'll actually speed things up. So when it comes to us, we can quickly um, write the loan. But, you know, $50,000 may not be enough money. I hear your point. It could be, it's the same phenomena going on in the States. Uh, this is a starting benchmark that the bank has agreed to look at $5 million to pump into the economy. What happens after that is a very good question. So anybody that is looking to borrow $50,000, then that should essentially be their operational cost for say, maybe at least six months. It's, it's no point in getting 50,000 if that money is gonna be utilized in a month or two, because you'll be right back to square one to your point. But this is initial assistance for those small and micro businesses that can use those money um, to keep their operations going for the, at least to the, med the short to medium term um, future. If something okay. was to, if, you know, I can't say at this point in time whether the bank is going to be providing more funds after this five million has been utilized, that's something that we would have to go back to the drawing table with the ministers. Okay, no, that's yeah, what I was trying I, I was only, sorry, I was only trying to make sure if, you know, if I was to mm -hmm. get my uh, famous accounts together and provide it and it says, okay, it's six to 2,000 for six months, for example, you know, is it limited at, at that? Because then you would still ask for that particular assets for that particular amount. And I'm just using those figures because it doesn't mean, I just want to understand if this was stuck at 50, you know, 50,000 max um and you know you're supposed to try to blend the business so yeah this requires more than this it is yeah this particular this particular program is that's the maximum fifty thousand. if you need something that's higher than that then it would have to be done based on the cidb's existing small business program the criteria is going to be different and the interest rate is going to be different as well well, yeah, the program. It's also a low interest program, so the interest rate is lower than other commercial loans. And I think the whole point of it as well, as Tracy um, said, is this is why we you also have to do the technical assistance program. It's designed as more of a holistic help. They're not just giving you fifty thousand. You're getting a loan of fifty thousand and you're getting a professional to help you plan the future. Uh, it might not be enough for a lot of you, um, but it will make a difference to a lot of people. And hopefully for a lot of businesses, it might just get them through um, through the whole thing. And if I could, if I could add too, to Lauren's point that what was going on in the United States, the first um, wave of money that they put out into the economy was like $349 billion. The, the bigger companies came in and swooped and got all that money first and it left some of the mom and pop shops dry. We're, we're actually 
doing the, the complete reverse. We are trying to get money out to the small businesses first. Um, and, you know, maybe 50,000, 20,000 might not be enough, but it is a starting point. And um, the small business center should be able to help these clients look at where their costs are and say, you know what, you probably can make do with this amount of money until the end of the year, and then we can revisit the applicant situation. So what I want to do now is I think we're just about at the end. I just want to show everybody, I think I shared my screen. So can everybody see the economic report that is, can everybody see that? Yeah. Okay, this, we just commissioned an economist to give us a general sense of the economic impact of this, uh, of, of COVID-19. This kind of, you'll be getting this by email and you'll see it in the media, but I just thought I'd give it to you first as to see it here. So basically that we have three projected shelter in place scenarios, March and May, March to June, and then March to July, four months. So we're predicting that there's gonna be a fifth, if we do just two months, there's gonna be a 15% decline in GDP. A three month is 19% decline and a four month is 22%. So basically to give you an indication is that's what we're looking at in terms of job losses for both Caymanians and non-Caymanians during those periods. So you can see the gravity of the crisis that we're experiencing in our economy. Um, again, an, an estimated for a lockdown of two months is 10,712 job losses. So it's pretty substantial. And then obviously, if we have a four month lockdown, it's gonna be 14,000 job losses in our society. So it's very dramatic. And then if we look at the estimated salaries loss in our economy, again, a four month lockdown is virtually a half a billion dollars that is not going to be put into our local economy and what is being lost. So these are pretty dramatic numbers for, for all of us to realize. And then in terms of our, our businesses, I get 94 businesses indicated that at least one work permit holder job is at risk of 94 businesses. And that's a survey that we did of over 300 businesses in our, in, across the islands. I mean, is, this is just to give us a sample of the gravity of the crisis that we're in. Um, and again, we will be releasing this to the public as well as a very comprehensive report that we're going to be sharing by an economist that we hired from the chamber to actually evaluate the seriousness of the crisis. So Lauren's presentation, we'd like to thank Lauren for presenting to us an outstanding presentation. I'd like to thank Althea as well as Tracy, both um, one from the Center for Business Development and also the Cayman Islands Development Bank. And just finally, I'd like to tell everybody that we are planning uh, six more webinars over, over the next short period, and we'll let you know what those are. We're all going to, we'll send you each a survey uh, about the topics that we're gonna be putting forward. And we'd ask you to tell us what topics you're most interested in. We had over 160 people on this call, which demonstrates the, the need for this type of information at this time. So again, I'd like to thank Lauren from Berman Fisher. I'd like to thank Althea. And I'd like to thank Tracy and her team from the Cayman Islands Development Bank for participating in this call. And again, I wish all of you the best with your businesses. And again, the Chamber is here to help, as well as these other partners that are on this call. So we're, we're in this together. So um, we have to get our domestic economy rolling as quickly as possible, as, as soon as the health officials tell us it's okay. So let's all work together in supporting each other. So thank you for participating in this call. Have a great afternoon. Thanks, thank Will. Everybody. Thank you so much, Will. And thanks, everyone, for this fine presentation. Lauren, Althea, and the rest of the crew, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, Terrence. Okay, bye, thanks. Awesome work, awesome work. I know.